before we start, so this is going to be very interactive, um, and uh, we're going to do some thinking and talking and working together, hopefully. Um, but before we start, I thought it would be good to just go around the room very quickly and just for each person to say, what is their name? And then answer one question, and that question is, Jim Room or Josh Jarrett? <laughs> oh. We'll start right here. Uh, Charlie and Jarrett. Just maybe stand up and tell everyone, kind of show everyone who you are. Um, we can do this quickly. Kurt Bowler, like Josh Jarrett. I'm Tomo. Uh, I'll say Josh. David Peterson and Ivy Clyde Fitzgerald. Carly Silly and I like the guy with that whose name begins with J. On Pina Ram, I certainly like that Jim Blue. Benny Swinder, uh, Jared. Uh, uh, James and uh, Josh, definitely. Bob Gavitz and Jim. I'm Lori Seibert, I'm the side. Charles Snare, undecided. And Jonas, both. Uh oh, there's a trend here. Paul Lawrence, uh, groom, we go to St. Barber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ellie Green, uh, Jim. Uh, Mike Peters, Jim Drew. Uh, you want to go? Jay Heat, Josh. Uh, Andrew Malagasy, Jim Drew Rocks. <laughs> Michael Feldstein, I want to see the love child. <laughs> Sarah Lou, Stefan Levy, one foot in each world. Um, Kevin Bell, I like Josh Drew. <laughs> nice. Uh, Mike Silver, I like Josh's grooming. <laughs> Preston Parker, too. Heather Leary, undecided. Could be the last. <coughs> Can't be all right. We're all about it. Can we have to read this about them? Uh, Dr. Babette, I'm friends with Jeff, so I can't read about it. <laughs> John Mayer, it's not about who you like, it's experience. <laughs> 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 I'm wearing a sports coat, that's still both. <laughs> <laughs> Albert Ashton, Jim Groom. Shane Gallagher, both. Oh, Scott Ashton, Jim. Kevin Ashton, both. Bob Montgomery, Jim. I don't know where we're actually not voting, it's just a question. Jim Room or Josh Jarrett? Oh, Jim. Yeah, I only like a rabbit. Someone in the door there? I don't know the question. Jim Room or Josh Jarrett? Oh, um, yeah, there's going to be marriage there. Carl Schaeffler, Chris Goldblatt. George Goldblatt. What was he doing? Different people. Eric Popper, both. Luna Daly, both. Matt Burkhart, Jim. Uh, Marani, much Kumara, I like both. Ben Wilson, and Josh. Ira Gooding, the head says Josh, the heart says Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Ariel Diaz, Josh. Jeff Davidson, Taylor Foundation, yes to both. Kim Murray, both. Sarah Kern, Jim. Royce Kimmins, Jim. On Satoshi Amalakia, this is my first session today, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Colin Clark, I slept in this morning, so I'm distinctly unqualified. Is it even good in the front row? I'm thinking it's definitely a gym. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Sean Hartman, definitely both. Car Ash Bissell, Jim and Jerry. And we have more seats here at the front, actually, or on the sides, and kind of, if you guys want to sit. Um, you can still leave in the middle. <laughs> okay, so I think that, that the set of keynotes is actually going to shake up what we can talk about here a little bit in a good way. Um, but I'll just quickly run through some slides that I put together to provide a little bit, as little mm -hmm. context as necessary, I thought. Um, and I'm actually also a little surprised that there are so many people here because I submitted this session idea kind of a little bit tongue in cheek and I, I wasn't, first I didn't think it was going to make it into the program and then <laughs> I really didn't think that there would be uh, over, I mean, well, however many people are here, but many people. Um, so uh, Can You Play is kind of that, the moment when as a kid you're coming into the playground to play 
football in Germany where I grew up, and uh, you don't know the other guys, and then that, there's that question, that, you know, can you play? And I'm sure it's the same in the States when you play basketball or any other sport. And it's that weird moment where they don't know anything about you, you've maybe watched them a little bit, but then you're nervous, and how well can you play, and you know, you know if you could... In the States you say, do you have game? Do you have game? Okay. Um, do you have game? So, and uh, you kind of, you know, like, the, the, there's a, there isn't really a way to show them a passport or like, yes, I graduated from the school of football in the seventh grade. And, but in, in a, and so we, we're faced with these situations in our lives all the time where we have no certification for things that we can do or who we are. And um, maybe that's good or maybe that's, that's not. But um, why did I think that was a useful topic to talk about at the Open Education Conference? The reason is that it seems to me one of the big pushes that this community is, is, is kind of being confronted with, or one of the big uh, areas that people are saying we should be moving into is around assessment, certification, and, and credentials. And um, there are lots of interesting things happening uh, um, that we could kind of dive into, including uh, some of the work around badges that a lot of people here are familiar with, and, and Carla, who's sitting in the front here, is actually the project manager for the Open Badges Infrastructure Project at Mozilla. Um, she works with Aaron Knight, that some of you might know. Who just um, had a baby on Wednesday. <laughs> Who just had a baby. Um, she immediately received a baby, what is it, the baby badge? The baby badge. <laughs> Actually, I, I will pull that up later and show you guys, there is that badge. Um, but anyway, so there's, there's, some, there's this uh, focus that's shifting certainly into analytics and you know, how can we track what people learn and what we say about their competencies, and it's become a big focus area for open education. And there are these statements that we need some validation, we need standardization so we can compare success, we need to be able to have kind of compatibility across different sets of standards, and, and we're at the beginning of a very interesting, I think, trajectory where we're, where we're going with this. So I think it's a, it's a good time to talk about this kind of in a more general way. And then the kind of hesitation I bring to this is, is some of the stuff I, I, I'm observing and, and hearing. And so there's, for example, uh, James, I never know if it's G or G, but he's a, um, a kind of well-known researcher in, in, uh, around games and learning and digital literacies. And he basically said testing is primitive. So any kind of testing that you do to assess learning is primitive and will never re produce any you know, really meaningful results. And so he, he's come up with these pretty strong statements against testing. Um, and, and then people are, you know, arguing around that. It's like games don't have tests. If you work through a game, you kind of get to the next level when you've achieved a certain level of competency. But no one says, stop, let's do a test if you've really achieved those things. But you've actually, you know, like you, you get onto that basketball court, you hit the first three three-point attempts. It's like it's clear that you can, you can play and you don't, you know, they don't stop you there and say, how many meters is the three-point line away from the basket? How high is the basket? Uh, who shot the most three points in the 1979 season? But it's like, you could, you know, it's like it's part of what's important about playing basketball, which is playing basketball. And communities, likewise, don't really have tests, and, and that is also intellectual communities, where we have very sophisticated patterns of new people coming into the community, often through processes of mentorship or apprenticeship, and it's focused around the activities that the community cares about. And in that process, assessments are, are made, feedback is given, learning happens, but there rarely is uh, kind of a, a test that is so that is disconnected from the, the, the actual projects that people are working on or the learning that happens. And so there's a, there's a certain feeling that these, these games or these communities, they know people's competencies. And um, I think in that, in that tension between the the desire to test and quantify everything and, and to just know everything. Somewhere, and, and there are problems with this as well, I think. Um, somewhere in the middle there is, is an interesting space. And I just want to give one example um, kind of as a story, because someone told me you need to include stories in presentations. <laughs> it's the only way people listen and, and um, remember anything. So there's Auguste Rodin, who's arguably the greatest, uh, the father of modern sculpture and, and one of the greatest sculptors in the history of sculpture, he, when, you, when you look at his work and his life, um, there are some interesting things about assessment and, and certification that we can take from it. And one is, I think, about the process of assessment. So I thought about this a little bit. Is, like, there are always constraints that are part of assessment. 
you, you, you always have to focus, either you need a series of questions, or you have a series of multiple choice options, or you have a certain time limit to produce something. But we, the assessment always is, there, there are certain constraints in a, in a very broad sense. And in his work, the, the constraints of assessments are really set by the, the stone and the tools. And then his ability or his competence is the, the, the process of using, kind of pushing up against these constraints and creating a, a work of art that happens in that tension between the constraints and his creativity. And maybe that, so I don't usually talk in that. Anyway, let me <laughs> that. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm on thin ice here with these uh, very artsy fartsy. Uh, uh, things, but, but I, I, I'm going with it anyway. So, um, so I think there's there's something about constraints that we that that's kind of an interesting concept when we think about assessment and, and what are good constraints and what are bad constraints and what are meaningful constraints and how do we make sure that the constraints are meaningful um, and and actually uh, uh, useful and then and then there's something around measurements. Um, so, in in his case. He, uh, um, he was never admitted into the, the great art school of France. That was his, his dream was to go to this, this, uh, this great school, and he applied three times, and he was rejected three times. And at the time, the requirements to enter the school were actually fairly low. It wasn't so hard to get into the school. And so for him to be refused three times was a, a, a pretty crushing defeat. And thankfully, he carried on, and he became more of a craftsman for a while, and he kind of you know, worked his way up. And then eventually got to the point where he had the freedom to, to pursue his vision. But I think what this says about measurements is that, you know, we, we're putting, kind of, we're creating certain measurements or, or, or standards or qualifications that we expect, and the history has shown us over and over again that often the people who are doing the measuring are the wrong people, and the things they're measuring are the wrong things to measure. And so I just want, want us to keep that in mind as we think about assessments and analytics and all these things that, if we look at the history, like we, you know, we've basically, and, and this isn't just in arts. We're, it would be easy to discount this because it's hard to do this in arts. But what about Galileo, right? Like the things we were looking for in, in the history of science, often, if we had measured them and standardized them, we just listened to that. You know, what, how do we make that next step to the things that we don't know yet? We should be looking for. We should be measuring. So, um, you know, what could this, what could this world of assessment and certification look like? If we kind of what, what would the ideal world of assessment and, and certification look like? And you know, I think we can draw some inspiration from games. We can draw some inspiration from from sculpture, the constraint of the the the, uh, the material and the tools. Um, we can take some inspiration maybe from chess because it's so implicit in the act of playing chess that I never need to stop and ask you if you can play chess. If you play chess against me, you're most likely to win against me. By the way. And then I have some assessment of your ability to play, to play chess, and you have some uh, lower assessment of my ability to play chess. <laughs> so my question that I would like to discuss as a group it, is kind of around, you know, how can open learning, and really also pushing on the idea of open, why is open different than, than non-open learning? How can it be authentic or engaging or social so that it produces all the necessary evidence of achievements as a byproduct of the learning? So we don't need to stop to test. So this, this is kind of my, my broader question. And I think um, I, I, I was going to do this next, but I think I want to pause. Let me tell you what I want to do next, but then I want to pause and I want us to spend a little bit of time discussing the keynotes, because I think there's so much rich stuff from the keynotes that actually is directly related to these questions. But so what I want to do after the, 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 the kind of open discussions, I want, to, I want you to group, form groups of two people. So just grab the person that sits next to you. If you know the person that sits next to you, probably grab someone else, um, someone you haven't spoken to, and spend five minutes or seven minutes uh, thinking about uh, assessment and certification in the open <coughs> education space, and try to find one example, or, or, or try to come up with one story of the perfect kind of assessment in an area that you care about. So if you work in a certain content era, area, and you think about assessment, how it's done, and, you think about kind of all the <coughs> dreams you may have for, for assessment in that area. Like what's a perfect example for amazing assessment in your area? And then also one example for an area or a case where the kind of more uh, inspirational, or the, some of these examples I've talked about, where that will never work. Like where we need the standardized tests, where we need the multiple choice reviews at the end, where we need 
you know, rigor and standards and kind of like structure and we need to have committees that agree on those and like the, 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 the big, the institutional level of assessment, like where, where do we absolutely need that? So those are the two things. But let's pause. And by the way, the Etherpad here, there's an address here. If it, uh, everyone can take notes in there. Um, it's, you don't need to log in or anything. You just open it in the web and you can see other people type. Um, don't use the chat. Uh, there's a, a, a ping attached to the chat. Uh, so if you start using the chat, it'll be endless ping in this room um, coming out of all your laptops. But if you want to start taking notes or putting stuff in there or even, you know, whatever, there's like a shared note taking space. Um, Available. Okay, but let's uh, let's not do this right now. Uh, I thought what would be most useful is after, especially for the people who have been to the keynotes, um, um, is to uh, to maybe just kind of general reactions on you know. It, it seemed to me like they were talking about two extreme ends of an open education future. And on both of those ends, there are interesting questions around certification and assessment and competencies. Uh, so I'd love to just maybe open the floor to anyone who has reactions or questions or uh, kind of when they were sitting in the keynote, they went, oh, I really want to ask or I really want to say something. We didn't have time at the end, which was frustrating. So I thought maybe we can do some of that now. Um, so I'll open the floor. There we go. First person. Uh, I think both of them pointed to, one of the things that both pointed to was that uh, the, um, system of education as it's been over the past centuries is breaking down. That's working for at least it. And what if, if it did work? If it did work, yeah, that's the other good question. And did, did, you, did you see any implications for the, the testing and assessment and, and, and those kind of things in those? Uh, I, I have a lot of thoughts about that myself, but uh, uh, I mean, let me just put it out. In my opinion, educational institutions uh, do two different things, and they can really be opposed to each other. And one of them is teaching, and the other is providing credentials. And, and one, for mm -hmm. some people, the ability to learn is really hindered by the fact that somebody's sitting in judgment of them while they're trying to learn. This, I've been really struck by, if you're older, like my aunt, Ivan Illich, uh, de-schooling was a huge thing what, 30 years ago, whenever it was. And uh, everybody got excited about it. And credentialing is probably 10 times more powerful now than it was then. So why? What, what happened? Because it was inspiring. It sounds like it's all happening again with the same kind of question. And yet, credentialing is the one thing that got sort of reinforced. Yeah, yeah I guess. And credentialing is, for me, is only one part of the problem. The, the way I heard those two talks is the, the tension between empowerment and scale, right? And I always go back, I thought that Josh's um, story about Brianna was incredibly moving for me, what it's always about, right? So on the one hand, there are a lot of people like Brianna out there, many, many, many people like Brianna out there who need help getting living lives of, of dignity and, and economic uh, self-sufficiency and so on. And there's a lot of sort of objective, skill-building kind of stuff you need to do. And credentials are just one of the devices, the very, very imperfect devices that we create to try and scale that, right? Um, on the other hand, I think when you listen to someone like Jim or, or Gardner, you know, what I get from them is that before they can achieve their goals in terms of learning these skills and so on, they have to be empowered. And talking about empowerment at scale is an oxymoron because empowerment is fundamentally personal. That, you know, that's what I got from Jim's talk more than anything else. People brought to their course, to that course, what they had and what was important to them. And it was the inside, the core inside of that course was I can, I can bring that and get value out of it before I can learn to do any, that I can do anything, I have to learn I can do something, right? And that's what that course teaches. You can't scale that. So, um, so that's what I saw as the tension in the bridge that we need to build. Although I actually thought, despite the differences, there were a lot of common messages in both talks, and one was exactly that about empowering students. 
And Josh was talking about the use of assessments so that students knew at the onset of a course what their probability was of actually completing it <coughs> and what that information did for the students. So there's empowerment, and you could do that kind of empowerment at scale and make it more human-centered, really, and more about the experience. The other thing about, I mean, obviously Jim was talking about experience, and I'm really excited to hear that conversation at this conference. But Josh was also talking about it. It's not just about resources floating out there. It's how are you going to create that system where they're used really effectively and combined with all the things that we know about learning. So I, I'm not going to give up on scaling empowerment and personalized learning and experiences of learning. I think that's so important. I'm still seeing this group, but I think that one thing that both of them and, and their talk now is moving me think about is the need for multiple assessments. And I think the reason I'm uh, resistant to choosing one or the, over the other is that I'm nervous about trying to find the perfect assessment model. Because I think that, and I'm, I'm still thinking this through, but I think that different assessments might work best for different people. I am very nervous about standardized tests. But I also know some people who uh, weren't so great in the classroom because classrooms were boring, but were able to show their um, knowledge and intelligence on standardized tests. I know other people who don't do well on standardized tests but do great in the classroom or on particular um, assignments. So I think that what's important to me is, is finding the multiplicity of assessments and, and drawing from the different talks for different sorts of things. It strikes me that you know, this was a lot about empowering students. Well, if you go into the public schools and you say, are the teachers empowered? Well, I don't feel So this is certain, and why not? Well, partially because of all of the constraints that are placed on So they don't feel like, well, what, sh what do I feel is best? Well, I, I can't think about that because I have to. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I'm getting more than So I. I think before I can really engage in the conversation, I, th I ask the question, um, accreditation or assessment for what? Right, so is it for, is it to get a job? Is it because it's a scorecard at some point in our lives to say we've engaged in a social activity to become better informed citizens? I mean, there are a lot of folks that are very concerned in universities right now that a major part of what colleges and universities do is to help create uh, better folks that are better educated and that forms a better citizenry which makes a stronger social fabric and it's not a, necessarily about getting a job and, and that's uh, there's there's tensions there um, I think it, that gets very interesting when you talk about badges right because clearly if you're an employer and you've got a specific set of skills and competencies that you want and if you're a student looking for a job that's really your goal certainly in today's day and age that's a probably a big goal of a lot of students um, then that's important, then that's an okay. So I, I'm, I'm with you. It, you're, you're asking what assessments might be best, and I've got a lot of questions about why are we assessing and, and for what aims. And I think that there's a lot, there's different <coughs> pathways there, but we need to be transparent about that. So when students come into an educational environment, whatever it might be, there should be transparency about, you know, here's a pathway of assessment that's really about getting a job. This is a pathway of assessment. It's really about the liberal arts education, right? There, there's different answers, I think. Liberal arts education is the work in your job. They certainly can't All right, so um, I come from a liberal arts school and a very good one at that. But listening to Brianna's story and connecting that with what Jim Shelton and Martha had to say yesterday, I mean, it's very obvious that the current system has failed people like Brianna. And so what I would like to us actually, or someone to take the leadership, is to go back to people who make the policy on accreditation, because they hold the gates for new models to evolve. So when you have new models of education, which are looking at other ways of, of educating people like Brianna, they shouldn't be held back because the SACS accreditation isn't available, or whatever, you know, whatever the, the thing is. So I think it's, in conversations like this and in meetings like this, we should be able to empower people who are willing to put out new models of colleges that are, that, that are completely unlike where I come from, which is a wonderful college, but nevertheless. 
we will never be able to serve the Brianas of the world. And, we sh and, and, and Brianas of the world shouldn't have to hit at our doors and fail, because there is something about them that's good and valuable. We just need a different system, a different college model or an educational model to give them the ability to say, I'm educated and I am employable and go forth there. So it needs to go back to the gyms and the markets. The three people, maybe Carla, is this a direct? It looked it like is, there was a response. It is obviously I'm trying to badges. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's lots of great questions here. The one thing that I, I think about when I think about badges is learning is lifelong. And we're really talking about kind of a subset here. And they're all kind of things that people have skills and competence even that they don't get recognized for, but they make them really great citizens or really great partners or really great workers. And, and so I think there's lots of opportunities. So the big question is like, okay, so what kind of assessment are we talking about? And then who are the right people to be assessing? Can your peers assess you? Um, do, does it have to be top down? But then likewise, also addressing what Peter was talking about, you know, you know, from a from a, uh, a, a governmental standpoint, what are the standards that kind of exist right now, and can we start to think about them in a brand new and broader way? Um. I'm not exactly sure mm -hmm. what we mean when we say that current systems have failed us. I understand what system we're talking about. Are we talking about our society? Are we talking about research one of these treatments? Are we talking about K through 12 schools? Are we talking about community colleges? Um, are we talking about society? I mean, what are we preparing these students to be, right? What are we preparing them for? Um, and we can start re envisioning current systems, but we can also start envisioning new systems to serve people in what we want to I just thought it was just that. Sure. Yeah, no. uh, I was just thinking that it's a test or an assessment isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it can be an illuminating thing. It's just that we've often attached a certain stigma to kids who, or, or even adults who fear failure. I mean, a failed test is not so much a bad thing as a great opportunity because now you know what you don't know. Before you take the test, you're sort of you probably think you know everything. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't walk into a test if you didn't think you knew what the material. So a test is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's how we deal with them and judge them. And I think it's a great opportunity. Oh, great. This is awesome that you failed this test because now we can help you on these six questions that you clearly need a little bit of help with. So I guess reframing it can have a positive impact. I think video games are good examples, or chess too. If I lose to you in chess, and I never play chess again and just go on to basketball. That's not helping me learn, it's helping me sort of just pass by and forget all the opportunity I could have had for you to teach me or someone else to yeah. teach me. I think this is an excellent point. I want to just respond quickly. There's, uh, there's been some research recently about uh, learning and the importance of failure and problems, and the uh, research showed that the, 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 the key thing is how you deal with that failure. So. If you, we all fail, right? But if you fail and the failure happens in a way that encourages you to then kind of try again and find the answers, mm -hmm. that's how learning happens. Yeah. If you fail and then you go and play basketball, uh, then no learning happens essentially. And, and there are these, apparently there are these two broad strategies that we develop for dealing with failure. And they're related to encouragement of expertise or motivation. So if we tell our kids that they're very smart, when they fail, they, it's, a, it's a big shock because all of a sudden they're attaching their identities, I'm smart, I'm failing, it threatens my identity. They, they then tend to not try again because they don't want to have that bad experience. If we uh, encourage them to work hard and we say, it's amazing, you've worked really hard to get this, they, they start developing a sense of kind of trying and you, know, you get somewhere through trying and when they run into problems, they'll try again and they learn, end up learning more, which I thought was really interesting. I think it's related to how we assess them and what we reflect through the assessments. Do we encourage you to try again or do we encourage you to go somewhere else? I put a um, New York Times article about that very thing in the Perfect. So there's a hand there and then uh, we have one there. So it occurs to me that you know, when we're talking about you, know, you play basketball and you, you lose and you never play basketball again or whatever, we're talking about finality versus something that happens in an iterative cycle. Yeah. You know, if you play chess, and you play another game, you play another game, you're iterating through these things. You know, it's the, I think that's part of the key is that if, if, if assessment comes at the end, then you're too late. I mean, you missed seven questions, and great, I now know what I don't know, but we're moving on. We're moving to other topics. So I can stop and go back. But if it's iteratively you know, working, that's 
I'm not, that's a different kind of story. And the other thing that I was thinking, I, I'm not sure where this part fits in, but when we're talking about things like badges and proof, it strikes me that we're really close to the idea of a portfolio of work. Mm -hmm. you know, if you want to know, can I build a website? Well, that's the thing I go look at the website I built. If, if it's a mess, if the code's, if the code's horrible, then obviously I don't. But that's the kind of most honest badge there is, is this is what I've done. Uh, I don't remember. I think you are next, and then here's a hand, and then here's a hand. So I think one of the things we tend to gloss over when we talk about authentic assessments, we worry a lot about false negatives, that we're not giving credit for people who deserve credit. But I think we also need to worry about false positives. I think we need to spare a thought for the poor deluded souls who graduate from Ivy League schools, thinking that they have necessarily learned something because they've graduated from Ivy League schools. We actually have a pretty pure test of that here, which is the financial services industry. Yes. If anyone has ever talked to all, all those folks that were recruited directly out of tier, top tier schools, if you've ever talked to a sell side stock analyst about what they think about educational technology companies and who's dominant and why, you have pretty good evidence that these folks have not been taught critical thinking skills. Um, and they come from good elementary schools, good high schools, all that, good college. Not their fault. Um, our, just to what the other gentleman was saying, our educational system is geared towards a prior age. And so um, it's become this engine that has a life of its own. So people learn to be good at school. Yes. Um, and we don't know whether that's what they come out with is of any use at all. They can't tell you why the seasons happen either. They what? They can't tell you the Harvard the grad study showed that the graduates <laughs> couldn't tell you why the seasons oh, happen. Or why the space is That's great. Um, and I think it, it ties back to the idea of any kind of credential is a proxy. It's a, it, it holds meaning, and people attribute different types of meaning to it. And a, that credential for an Ivy League college, we all think have ideas of what that means. And those ideas are grounded in a long history, ideally, or there's some evidence. But they take on a, a kind of a value of, the, of their own. And there's no way to actually now go back and look at that credential and then drill deeper and say, you know, like, what did this person do exactly? Do they know critical thinking? So we kind of we, we bundle it all up into this very, very high level aggregate. And we hope that the important things are in there. Um, I think there was a hand here then. Um. So uh, just the, the point I was going to make was just uh, what you said, is, which is, sorry. Uh, no, no, that, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, it's a proxy. It's it's very imperfect, blunt instrument. And, and, and there are, you know, different uh, degrees or um, uh, details, like, you know, um, uh, getting a degree from certain school is one level, but uh, getting a grade for one school, uh, for one course, is another, mm -hmm. and and you can go down to uh, minute details. Um, if you know he did answer this question that way or that this way, he wrote this uh, uh, essay for this assignment, and and we cannot really deal with infinite amount of details to get the society <coughs> to work or economy at least. So we rely on those proxies for the sake of efficiency, but it inevitably fails. You know, um, it do it does injustice to individual cases. It does uh, fail to sometimes uh, capture the whole mass of things because of the the misconception of what it represents, what it doesn't. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I don't think we can uh, just altogether throw it away. And, and I also have this idea that, you know, um, it is a lifelong learning kind of thing. And we need to have that kind of proxy in order for, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, to um, um, promote the, the circulation of information about who knows what, who has that, what kind of skills. And if we don't, then we might end up with even uh, more imperfect uh, signals, uh, signals in the economic sense, you know, so he did that, or he's a friend of this, he is trusted by this guy, and that might be the only signals that we might rely on, which isn't that good 
uh, as compared to some more specific badges, is my guess. Thank you. I would like to raise a fundamental question, um, being from the Netherlands, you might expect that maybe. Um, our assessments, procedures, and mechanisms are far from perfect. We all know that. And uh, I'll give the example of a senior <coughs> student at the Open University in the Netherlands who was passing a philosophy exam. It was a multiple choice exam, uh, 80 questions, and did not pass the exam. And I was asking the, exa the examiner what would have happened if he would have a, an oral examination. And the examiner said, well, he would have passed uh, uh, at a very high level because he knew the students was very good. What it shows is that we, the way we are examining uh, students is not as far from perfect. Uh, and because that's, that's true, and also because we are <coughs> referring to the word constraint, because the limitations and the constraints of, of, of our assessments mechanism, I doubt, let's say, the tendency that you are observing now, that you can uncouple the learning process and the assessment process. Uh, that's my fundamental question. I, it's at the heart of this discussion, I think, yes. and I'd like to raise this question because I, I'm not so sure about uh, the, the, the added value of uncoupling the two things. Because I think the example of philosophy student shows that because the examiner knows, knows the student from the learning process, he knows that he, did, he should have passed the exam, right? And uh, I'm sure we can improve on assessment very, very much, but I'm sure we cannot improve to the perfect level. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Uh, I'll, I'll start with, with coming back to the original question around Josh versus Jim. And I think Josh lays out a really analytical framework for how to think about all the challenges and problems. And Jim provides a very inspiring example of one way to really achieve that. And I think for that reason, they actually work in, in cohort. And one, one model uh, of education to, to draw out there and what that leads to in terms of lifelong learning, in terms of recruiting everything, it's really about inspiring curiosity and providing tools. And tools evolve across the educational landscape. Uh, and curiosity is something that we do our best to feed out of children at a very young age. Uh, but if you continue to inspire that curiosity and continue to provide the tools as those tools evolve and evaluate those tools, and if, if you discretize a lot of the core tools, you can actually, measure, you can actually get up to a very deep understanding of what's the foundational tools around logic, around reading comprehension, and then you can continue to build off of those. And then once you combine those, you get into very interesting questions of how you really assess and teach, which should be combined. And the question is how you scale the assessment <coughs> if it's an integral product, part of learning, which becomes a more difficult challenge to scale, which is part of the, the broader question. But I think that's one, one framework. You know, I think Josh put out this analytical framework. Jim has this inspirational example. And how do we synthesize you know, this curiosity and, and, and measuring tools and not to evaluate and, and promote failure, as somebody mentioned, but as a way to know where are the tools deficient and how do we improve those tools and then how do we continue to, to drive those tools to achieve broad things across, across citizenship, across career paths, etc. So there, there's one more hand there and then I'd like to have shift gears. So yes. What's been missing to me in the most of the discussion is the discussion around the learning targets for the outcomes and the question of validity. Um, I'm dealing with assessments. I, credentialing and assessments are not the same thing. And uh, when, you, when you design assessments, you have to understand what you're assessing, what the targets are, the goals, purpose, context, and the various forms of evidence that you have to collect to prove or try to, uh, try to prove that that outcome or that target was met. Uh, but it doesn't really matter what Project it is whether it results in a badge or, or anything else, uh, and, then that, and then then the validity of that, if it results into some sort of credential, fine. But you're really about the validity of those assessments and how that was designed. What I didn't see and hear about from Josh's discussion was anything about what the students were still supposed to be learning, the rate, destructivist, experiential type of environment. Totally agree with that, but I didn't know what they were supposed to come out with the end anyway other than they were going through all of this, so we were doing some things. Uh, we which gem, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, gems, you know. and the gems, I'm yeah. sorry. I thought I, I Josh. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, and Josh did mention some things about, you know, what are the targets of somewhat, but not 
you know, but, but it was a, a different discussion. But that, that wasn't, uh, so, so the, when we think about this, that's what's missing for me. I'm not, you know, we're, even though the badges and what we start discussing is, okay, let's talk about the validity of, of attainment, evidences of attainment that you've met this, and how you're getting there, and then, only then can you say, yes, this credential is right. If you play chess and you, and maybe the outcome doesn't do you winning at chess, in some cases you may not care about how you won, the fact that you won. Okay, well that's an outcome. And you know, that's an assessment in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. And actually in chess they have very sophisticated measurements then that calculate my, and you my can score break, based on right. who I beat and who they beat. And, and you can take the learning model around chess and break that down and yeah, get yeah, very yeah. granular with it. But uh, that's, you know, so that's, that's kind of what I haven't heard a lot. Yeah. So I would love, there are two more hands now, but I would love for us to actually move into the practical because it's always, mm -hmm. like we, I think it's, it's nice to stay in the theoretical and kind of engage with the ideas and then to walk out the door and kind of, you know, have had an interesting conversation, but it beats kind of, you know, the next step is really to get their, our hands into what this could look like. So I would love for us to try to think about concrete examples. And the two kind of ideas I had is if you could just grab the person that sits next to you, if you know them or you work with them a lot, grab someone else. And spend five minutes to really thinking about, maybe pick one of the two, either an area where some of the more out there ideas, no more credentials, no more tests, where that will never work, and for good reasons, people are running out the door now. <laughs> um, which is fine. Like, uh, but, uh, or pick an example where that is close to your heart, where you, you think there could be a much, much better way of doing assessment and credentialing, or, or assessment or credentialing, and you, you map out maybe in a few bullet points what that could look like. Who is the, the source of validity? What's the mechanism of doing the assessment? What is the assessment done for? So that we can collect a few kind of examples or case studies, which will then help us in the next step to think through all the, the uh, complications. So, um, ready, set, go. <laughs> um, I'm going to check about five minutes so that we have at least a little bit of time for uh, This is a very unruly class, <laughs> which is a good sign. Um, so there's a lot of juice in this, which is great, but I wonder, so two things. One is, if you have any chance to put some notes into this etherpad of what you've just talked uh, about with your partner, please do, um, because I would love to see some of that stuff. And then secondly, can we just have like one or two people who want to maybe give a little rundown of what they talked about? So we've got one volunteer, two volunteers, maybe a third, Andrew. Four. Okay, we'll do four. But you only have about one minute each, and we're already running over. So we'll do it. We'll do it quickly. Yeah, uh, we talked about uh, portfolio assessment and how portfolios will uh, is a demonstration of what you know rather than uh, credential. Wow. Okay. Uh, we talk, the the example that's difficult to measure is doctors, where you think one way to measure whether they're good or not is malpractice suits, but that actually correlates <laughs> orthogonally to whether to how they did on the board and what school they went to. It's all about the personality uh, in terms of not being sued. So that's an, an, an area where it's almost any assessment you can do is orthogonal to whether, what you're actually measuring. And then an area where it's actually positive is uh, and things that you should be able to algorithmically assess and, and scalably assess uh, on a progression scale, which is why video games work because you don't just randomly buy a huge character you buy little characters and then bigger characters and bigger characters and it's all progression based like you know the Toyota production system that stopped and so you learn that skill which is something that's very very mean measurable in in math and reading comprehension for example excellent Andrew Hi. we talked about like, Jay's uh, experience mostly in vocational uh, instruction and how obviously the best way to know if someone gets it is to walk inside their brain if you were psychic. That would be ideal. <laughs> Since we're not, um, you know, we have to use other sort of proxies and things. And generally speaking, we were saying that the best way is just observe them doing it, whether it's doing a balance sheet or rebuilding a transmission or doing woodwork or I suppose even mathematics. If there are a way for direct observation, and I suppose even <coughs> I'm adding this coaching after the fact to just talk about, talk through the problems. I think that would be more constructive means of assessment than anything else. So I'm just building on that. So, 
sort of want to contrast two, two things twice. Um, so firstly, there, there's an important distinction between knowing certain specific things, such as sort of content or natural knowledge, and then the, the, the other thing which is knowing how to do something, or just in general how you approach solving a particular problem. And that's really hard to assess using a standardized sort of the bubble kind of test. So that contrast, and then building on that, I think it's important to also think about the, the advantages and disadvantages of two, two, these two ways of testing. So on the one hand, the sort of the big hammer where you try and test just at a base level what people know, so base standardized testing. And you really have to know that that is a minimum, minimum kind of test. It doesn't really tell you much about a person, but it tells you, it, it, it gives you sort of a lower bar on what they know. Um, and then on the other end, so sort of, other end, so not the base, but more sort of the, the tip of the sort of upside down key is just assessing really how so the kind of things that are hard to assess, like how people approach problems. I think it's much done much better through sort of uh, almost like a network of trust kind of model where if somebody else whom you trust tells you that this other person is really good at doing X, then you, you have good reasons to believe that you trust this person. And I think that's, that's a much more expensive, but a much better way of assessing those kinds of skills. Can we have one more hand? Okay. Um, we talked about the, an area where the kind of the advantage of having I think in general our, our kind of discussion was about how there are different kinds of assessments and um, we talked about how like a brain surgeon, you would want to know that they knew their biology. Um, you know, that's something where you kind of need to make sure that they know the parts of the brain. It's really important. Um, something else I was thinking about is like that assessment doesn't have to be uh, black and white master or not, I think always. Um, I think sometimes it could be, okay, people know this in this context, or here are things that help people succeed. Um, that it's not necessarily always going to be that brain surgeon, like they need to know the, the parts of the brain, but hey, this person counsels really well uh, when they're working with this type of person, somebody who's outgoing, say, but this type of person, somebody who needs to be drawn out more, they're not a good counselor for that situation. Um, or they need these structures to be a good counselor in that situation. So that it, it's not, it's sometimes black and white, need to know the brain, but that it's not always that simple. Okay. Well, actually, Carlo's going to raise hand, but I'm going to ask you not to because I will, what we didn't talk about very much is the badges infrastructure, and I will come back to that a little bit in the, my presentation tomorrow. And so I, I think that's probably important. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you all very, very much. This was awesome.